they came flaming down out of a blind sky. On the first day, 10,000 died. The screams rang in our heads, and the women ran to the hills to escape the sound of it. But there was no escape for them, nor for any of us. The sky was aflame with death, and the terrible, unbelievable part of it was the death. The dying was not us. It started late in the evening. The first one appeared as a cosmic spark struck in the night. Then almost before the first had faded back into the dusk, there was another, and then another. And soon the sky was a jeweler's pad, twinkling with unnameable diamonds. I looked up from the observatory roof and saw them all, tiny pinpoints of brilliance cascading down like raindrops of fire. And somehow, before any of it was explained, I knew this was something important. Not important the way five extra inches of plastichrome on the tail fins of a new copter are important. Not important the way a war is important, but important the way the creation of the universe had been important, the way the death of it would be. And I knew it was happening all over Earth. There could be no doubt of that. All across the horizon, as far as I could see, they were falling and burning and burning. The sky was not brighter appreciably, but it was as though a million new stars had been hurled up there to live for a brief microsecond. Even as I watched, Portalis called to me from below. Frank! Frank, come down here! This is fantastic! I swung down the catwalk into the telescope dome and saw him hunched over the refraction eyepiece. He was pounding his fist against the side of the veneer adjustment box. It was a pounding of futility and strangeness. A pounding without meaning behind it. Look at this, Frank! Will you take a look at this? His voice was rising in inflection and disbelief. I nudged him aside and slid into the bucket. The scope was trained on Mars. The Martian sky was burning too. The same pinpoints of light, the same intense pyrotechnics spiraling down. We had allotted the evening to a study of the red planet, for it was clear in that direction and I saw it all very sharply, as brightness and darkness again, all across the face of the planet. Call Michael at Wilson, I told Portalis. Ask him about Venus. Behind me, I heard Portalis dialing the closed circuit number, and I half listened to his conversation with Aaron Beichel at Mount Wilson. I could see the flickering reflections of the vid screen on the phone as they washed across the burnished side of the scope. But I didn't turn around. I knew what the answer would be. Finally, he hung up and the colors died. The same, he said sharply, as though defying me to come up with an answer. I didn't bother snapping back at him. He had been bucking for my job as director of the observatory for nearly three years now, and I was accustomed to his antagonisms, desperately, as I had to machinate occasionally to keep him in his place. I watched for a while longer, then left the dome. I went downstairs and tuned in my shortwave radio, trying to find out what Tokyo or Heidelberg or Johannesburg had to say. I wasn't able to catch any mention of the phenomena during that short time I fiddled with the sweep, but I was certain they were saying it the same everywhere else. Then I went back to the dome to change the settings on the scope. After an argument with Portalis, I beamed the scope down till it was sharp to just inside the atmospheric blanket. I tipped in the sweeper and tried a fast scan of the sky but continued to miss the bursts of light at the moment of their explosion. So, 
I cut in the photo mechanism and set a wide angle to it. Then I cut off the sweep and started clicking them off. I reasoned that the frequency of the lights would inevitably bring one into photo focus. Then I went downstairs, back to the shortwave. I spent two hours with it and managed to pick up a news broadcast from Switzerland. I had been right, of course. Portalis rang me after two hours and said we had a full reel of photos and should he have them developed. This was too big to trust to his adolescent whims, and rather than have him fog up a valuable photo, I told him to leave them in the container and I'd be right up to handle it myself. When the photos came out of the solution, I had to finger through 30 or 40 of empty space before I caught 10 that had what I wanted. They were not meteorites. On the contrary, each of the flames in the sky was a creature. A living creature, but not human, far from it. The photos told what they looked like, but not till the Project Snatch ship went up and sucked one off the sky did we realize how large they were, and that they glowed with an inner light of their own and that they were telepathic. From what I can gather, it was no problem capturing one. The ship opened its cargo hatch and turned on the sucking mechanisms used to drag in Floatsum from space. The creature, however, could have stopped itself from being dragged into the ship merely by placing one of its seven taloned hands on either side of the hatch and resisting the sucker. But it was interested as we learned later. It had been 5,000 years, and they had not known we had come so far, and the creature was interested. So it came along. When they called me in, along with 500 odd other scientists, and Portalis managed to wangle himself a place in the complement, we went to the Smithsonian, where they had him installed and marveled, just stood and marveled. He, or she, we never knew, resembled the Egyptian god Ra. It had the head of a hawk, or what appeared to be a hawk, with great slitted eyes of green in which flecks of crimson and ember and black danced. Its body was thin to the point of emaciation, but humanoid, with two arms and two legs. There were bends and joints on the body where no such bends and joints existed on a human, but there was a definite chest cavity, an obvious buttocks, knees, and chin. The creature was pale, milky white, except on the hawk's crest, which was a brilliant blue, fading down into white. Its beak was light blue, also bending into the paleness of its flesh. It had seven toes to the foot, seven talons to the hand. The god Ra, god of the sun, god of light. The creature glowed from within with a pale but distinct aura that surrounded it like a halo. We stood there, looking up at it in the glass cage. There was nothing to say. There it was, the first creature from another world. We might be going into space in a few years, farther, that is, than the moon, which we had reached in 1970, or Mars, that we had circumnavigated in 1976. But for now, as far as we knew, the universe was wide and without end, and out there we would find unbelievable creatures to rival any imagining. But this... This was the first. We stared up at it. The being was 13 feet tall. Portalis was whispering something to Carl Laus from Caltech. I snorted to myself at the way he never gave up. For sheer guff and grab, I had to hand it to him. He was a pusher, all right. Laus wasn't impressed. It was apparent he wasn't interested in what Portalis had to say. But he had been a Nobel winner in 63, and he felt obligated 
to be polite to even obnoxious pushers like my assistant. The army man, whatever his name was, was standing on a platform near the high, huge glass case in which the creature stood, unmoving, but watching us. They had put food of all sorts through a feeder slot, but it was apparent the creature would not touch it. It merely stared down, silent as though amused, and unmoving as though uncaring. Gentlemen, gentlemen, may I have your attention? The army men corralled at us, a slow silence, indicative of our disrespect for him and his security measures that had caused us such grief getting into this meeting, fell through the groups of men and women at the foot of the case. We have called you here, Pompous asked with this we, as if he were the government incarnate, to try and solve the mystery of who this being is and what he has come to earth to find out. We detect in this creature a great menace to... And he went on and on, bleeding and parroting all the previous scare warnings we had had about every nation on earth. He could not have realized how we scoffed at him and wanted to hoot him off the platform. This creature was no menace. Had we not captured him, her, it, the being would have burnt to a cinder like its fellows falling into our atmosphere. We listened to him to the end. Then we moved in closer and stared at the creature. It opened its beak in what was uncommonly like a smile, and I felt a shiver run through me. The sort of shiver I get when I hear deeply emotional music, or the sort of shiver I get when making love. It was a basic trembling in the fibers of my body can't explain it, but it was a prelude to something. I paused in my thinking, just ceased my existence. If cogito ergo sum is the true test of existence. I stopped thinking and allowed myself to sniff of that strangeness, to savor the odor of space in faraway worlds, in one world in particular. A world where the winds are so strong that the inhabitants have hooks on their feet with which they dig into the firm green soil to maintain their footing. A world where the triple moons swim through azure skies and sing in their passage, playing on a lute of invisible strings. The seas and the deserts as accompanists a world of wonder, older than man, and older than the memory of the forever. I realized abruptly, as my mind began to function once more, that I had been listening to the creature. Ithk was the creature's name, denomination, gender, something. It was one of five hundred hundred thousand, like itself. Who had come to the system of soul. Come. No, perhaps that was the wrong word. They had been. Not by rockets, nothing that crude, nor space warp, nor even mental power, but a leap from their world. What was that name? Something the human tongue could not form, the human mind could not conceive, to this world in seconds. Not instantaneous, for that would have involved machinery of some sort, or the expansion of mental power. It was beyond that, and above that. It was an essence of travel. But they had come. They had come across the mega galaxies, hundreds of thousands of light years, incalculable distances from there to here, and Ithk was one of them. Then he began to talk to some of us. Not all of us there, for I could tell some were not receiving him. I don't attribute it to good or bad in any of us, nor intelligence, nor even sensitivity. Perhaps it was whim on Ithk's part, or the way he wanted to do it from necessity. 
but whatever it was, he spoke to only some of us there. I could see Portalis was receiving nothing. The old Carl Laus's face was in a state of rapture, and I knew he had the message himself. The creature was speaking in our minds telepathically. It did not amaze me or confound me nor even shock me. It seemed right. It seemed to go with its size and look, its aura and arrival. And Ith spoke to us. And when it was done, some of us crawled up on the platform and released the bolts that held the case of glass shut, though we all knew Ith could have left it at any second had it desired. But Ith had been interested in knowing before it burned itself out as its fellows had done, and it had found out about us little earth people. It had satisfied its curiosity on this instant's stopover before it went to hurtling, flaming destruction. It had been curious. For the last time Ith's people had come here, Earth had been without creatures who went into space, even as pitifully short a distance into space as we could venture. But now the stopover was finished, and Ithk had a short journey to complete. It had come an unimaginably long way for a purpose, and though this had been interesting, Ithk was anxious to join his fellows. So we unbolted the cage, which had never really confined, a creature that could be out of it at will, and Ithk was not there, gone. The sky was still flaming. One more pinpoint came into being suddenly, slipped down in a violent rush through the atmosphere and burned itself out like a wasting torch. Ithk was gone. Then we left. Carl Laus leaped from the 32nd story of a building in Washington that evening. Nine others died that day. And though I was not ready for that, there was a deadness in me. A feeling of waste and futility and hopelessness. I went back to the observatory and tried to drive the memory of what Ithk had said from my mind and my soul. If I had been as deeply perceptive as Laos or any of the other nine, I might have gone immediately, but I'm not in their category. They realized the full depth of what it had said and so, perceiving, they had taken their lives. I can understand they're doing it. They just just killed themselves, he babbled. Yeah, they killed themselves, I answered wearily, staring at the flaming burning sky from the observatory catwalk. It always seemed to be night now, always night with light. But why? Why would they do it? I spoke to hear my thoughts, for I knew what was coming because of what the creature said, what it said, what it told us, and what it did not tell us. It spoke to you, to some of us, to Laos and the Nine and others, and yeah, I heard it, but, but why didn't I hear it? I was right there. I shrugged, he had not heard. And that was all. Well, what did it say? Tell me, he demanded. I turned to him and looked at him. Would it affect him? No, I rather thought not. But that was good. Good for him and good for the others like him. For without them, man would cease to exist. So I told him. The lemmings, I said. You know, the lemmings. For no reason. For some deep, instinctual surging. They follow each other. And periodically throw themselves off the cliffs. They follow one another down to destruction. A racial trait. It was that way with the creature and his people. They came across the mega galaxies. To kill themselves here. To commit mass suicide in our solar system. 
to burn up in the atmosphere of Mars and Mercury and Venus and Earth, and to die. That's all. Just to die. His face was stunned. I could see he comprehended that. But what did it matter? That was not what had made Laos and the nine other scientists kill themselves. That was not what filled me with such a feeling of frustration. The drive of one race was not the drive of another. But, but I don't understand. I cut him off. That was what Ithk said. But why did they come here to die? He asked, confused. Why here and not some other solar system or some other galaxy? Why not their own? That was what Ithk had said. That was what we had wondered in our minds. Damn us for asking. And in its simple way, Ithk had answered. Because, I explained solely, softly, this is the end of the universe. His face did not register comprehension. I could see it was a concept he could not grasp. That the solar system, Earth's system, the backyard of Earth to be precise, was the end of the universe. Like the flat world over which the Columbus would have sailed into nothingness. This was the end of it all. Out there in the other direction lay a known universe with an end to it. But they, Ith's people, ruled it. It was theirs, and would always be theirs, for they had racial memory burnt into each embryo child born to their race, so they would never stagnate. After every lemming race, a new generation was born, that would live for thousands of years and advance. They would go on till they came here, to flame out in our atmosphere, but they would rule what they had while they had it. So to us, to the driving, unquestionably curious, seeking and roaming Earthmen whose life was tied up with wanting to know, needing to know, there was left nothing. Ashes. The dust of our own system. And after that, nothing. We were at a dead end. There would be no wandering among the stars. It was not that we couldn't go. We could. But we would be tolerated. It was their universe. And this, our Earth, was the dead end. Ithk had not known what it was doing when it said that to us. It had meant no evil. But it had doomed some of us. Those of us who dreamed. Those of us that wanted more than what Portalis wanted. I turned away from him and looked up. The sky was burning. I held very tightly to the bottle of sleeping tablets in my pocket. So much light up there, 